It's a great honor to be with President Kagame. And we have uh, had tremendous uh, discussions on Rwanda. The job they've done is uh, absolutely terrific. We have trade with Rwanda. Uh, and just general, I would say, great relationships. Uh, I want to congratulate you, Mr. President, uh, as being the new head of the African Union. That's a great honor. This was just announced recently, and uh, that really truly is a great honor. So please give my regards. I know you're going to your first meeting very shortly. And please give my warmest regards. But it's an honor to have you as a friend. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, it was a great honor to meet uh, the President of the United States, uh, President Donald Trump. And uh, we had good discussions uh, on those two levels. Uh, the, bilateral relations uh, between Rwanda and the United States. Rwanda has benefited tremendously uh, from the support of the United <coughs> States in many areas where it is in peace support operations we have carried out in different parts of the world. We had the United States on our side supporting us. We have supported our economy in trade, investment. We see a lot of uh, uh, Tourists from the United States, visitors sure. coming to Rwanda, and uh, President, I wanted to thank you for uh, the support you have received from you personally and the administration. And uh, we are looking forward to also working with the United States at the level of the African Union, where we are carrying out reforms at the African Union so that we get our act together to do the right things. and. That helps in cooperating with the United States. Uh, it would be more beneficial when we are organized to know what we want from the United States sure. for that cooperation. So I thank you very much. Well, I thank you very much. And it's a great honor to have all of you here. And uh, we'll speak for a little bit longer. And thank you very much.
ahead. As a poll is predicting that the Conservatives are the largest party. This exit poll is right. I will publicly eat my hat on the Of all the scenarios imagined, this seemed the least imaginable. The sitting Prime Minister off to see the Queen for a new mandate as the undisputed winner. And we can take these islands with our proud history and build an even prouder future. Together, we can make Great Britain greater still. That the government should call a general election to be held on the 8th of June. And what we're saying is the Conservatives are the largest party. Yay! They don't have an overall majority at this stage. It's time, frankly, that uh, the opposition summed up the nerve to submit themselves to the judgment of, of our collective boss, which is the people of, of the UK. of our exit poll, that's our first hint of the possible result. So, as Big Ben reaches 10 o'clock, we are standing by with the exit poll figures. Here they are. target seat MP. And in target seats like mine, the 2015 general election wasn't about Labour's failures. It wasn't about Jeremy Corbyn or getting Brexit done. It was about our local record of delivery. In just two years' time, our record of delivery will once again be a deciding factor in how people vote. So we need a massive effort to get our local success stories out, to share the incredible things we've achieved together as a party and to let people know about the important work that we're still doing, creating jobs, investing in public services, and improving lives. And that's what the 80-20 Target Seat campaign is all about. This is a targeted, focused campaign based on the 80 marginal seats we need to hold and the 20 marginal seats we have a serious chance of gaining. We're going to need a huge effort from everyone here today, every single activist, every single member, and every single association, just like we had in 2015. Because whilst the last two elections were short and snappy, this campaign will take place over two years, just like the 2015 campaign. No one is saying it's going to be easy, but if we pull together, I know from personal experience what a difference it can make. And I'm thrilled to say that we've already hit the ground running. We've got new campaign managers across the country helping MPs tell their stories. The first leaflet of the 8020 campaign is hitting doorsteps this summer. And over the next two years, there'll be an opportunity for everyone here and at home to play a role, whether that's sharing content on social media or talking to voters and changing minds. I'm confident that if we come together, put that effort in and get our message out, we can win the next general election. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy the hostings. We've got two excellent candidates and they're both clearly ready to be Prime Minister. But no matter which candidate you choose, let's remember that the country will be making a choice two years from now. A Labour government or a Conservative government. So let's get to work. <laughs>
Hi, I'm James, the campaign manager for Bolzer. You probably know the scene because in 2019 we released Dennis Skinner, the beast of Bolzer, from his parliamentary chains and elected Mark Fletcher, the first ever Conservative to represent this constituency. I've worked with Mark since May this year, helping to spread his local success stories, highlight our local legal factions, and strengthen our vote. Now, we've already delivered over 32,000 leaflets and surveys, but I'm not slowing down because I've got big new targets to meet. We need to recruit new canvassers, new deliverers, new activists to spread Mark's message, not just on the doorstep, but on social media as well. That's on top of running local issue campaigns, such as here in Blackwell, with the speeding campaign for the 8617, and organising community events. It's tough work, but it makes a huge difference, and none of it would be possible without members like you, and supporters like you. My position is funded entirely through donations, so every member, donor and supporter has the chance to play a massive role. Because although it's my job to grow the team here in Bolsover, campaign managers and successful campaigns rely on people across the country for support, whether that's knocking on doors or chipping in. So I hope that over the next two years, 80 to 20 candidates and MPs like Mark Fletcher can rely on you. Please welcome Chairman of the National Convention, Peter Booth. Good evening, Darlington. This is the fifth hustings in our nationwide tour, and for me, it's good to be home in the Northeast, where I was born and brought up in Sunderland. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for attending this evening. These hustings are for us, for the members of the Conservative Party, to take part in a great exercise of democracy where we get to choose our leader. No TV debates, just here tonight for you to ask questions. He or she will be announced on the 5th of September, and as will the party of government, will become Prime Minister very soon afterwards. As Ian Dale, who moderated many of the hustings in 2019, said, and I quote, I found chairing the hustings a surprisingly positive experience the members really put the two candidates through their paces and asked some very searching questions. So I ask you tonight to make your questions searching, to make them succinct, and to ask questions and not to make statements. One question each, please, so that more of the audience have an opportunity to grill our candidates. Both of our candidates have a duty and a desire to fulfil our 2019 manifesto. Their differences will be about how to go about achieving that in a very different world from 2019, post-Brexit, post-Covid, in uncertain times internationally, look at Ukraine and Taiwan, and where our union as a nation is being challenged. So I'm sure tonight that you want to test our candidates, to seek to establish their strengths, and to see who you think is best capable of running our great country. As we're all Conservatives here, I hope so, I know that you will be respectful of our two candidates and keep your questions positive. As you know, the ballot has opened. You can cast your vote online or by post. It's very easy to vote online or you can choose traditional snail mail. And if you do post, then please remember to put a stamp on the envelope. <laughs> You should receive your ballot paper by the 11th of August and then, if you haven't, please contact your constituency chairman and we'll get it sorted out for you. My hope is that this evening will give you more clarity about how to cast that ballot. I hope you'll go away enthused and energised in your commitment to helping our great party win the next election. We need your support. Finally, I want to thank our Darlington Chairman Pauline Cully down here for all that you do. And now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's get on with the show. Please welcome Andrew Stevenson, Chairman of the Conservative Party. Good evening and thank you for coming to our fifth nationwide hustings here in Darlington. 
I'm delighted to be joined by so many members of our party at another sold-out event where we're giving you, our members, the chance to put your questions directly to the two candidates. All these events are also available online, so welcome to those of you joining us virtually. Over the last couple of days, I've been getting out and about across the North East, campaigning with Conservative activists in uh, seats like North West Durham, Bishop Auckland, Hartlepool, Redcar and Cleveland, and with our excellent new Deputy Chairman, Matt Vickers. These seats, alongside several others in the region, are key to our victory at the next general election. So it's been great to campaign alongside so many of our dedicated party members. We've all seen the incredibly strong slate of candidates we've had for this contest. Together, the most diverse range of candidates for any leadership election in British history. <clears throat> Labour would love to have a female leader. But we could be about to have our third female Prime Minister before they've had one. <laughs> or our first Prime Minister of Asian heritage, the second Conservative Prime Minister from an ethnic minority background, Mr. Benjamin Disraeli. <laughs> I'm staying neutral in this contest. <laughs> As are, all of our <laughs> as are all of our hard-working party staff. But I do believe we have two fantastic candidates. Either can tackle the big issues our country is facing, taking us forward together. And we are the world's most successful political party. And that is down to our ideas, the support of our members and our record. Our current Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has shown that a Conservative government can rise to the challenges of today. Getting Brexit done, delivering the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe, protecting 14 million jobs during the pandemic, and leading the world in supporting Ukraine in standing up to Putin. That is a truly historic record which our next leader will build upon with the support of our members. Before we hear from each of our candidates, let us remember why a strong Conservative government is so important. The alternative is a Labour-led government, likely in coalition with the Liberal Democrats and the SNP, which would risk the integrity of our United Kingdom. Labour would have never got Brexit done. They voted against tax cuts for low-income families, they voted against more investment in our NHS, and they voted against protecting our borders and tackling the vile people smugglers. And now they want Sir Keir Starmer to run our country, <laughs> when he can't even get his party members on side with a hard-working majority of British people against Labour's union paymasters. With shadow ministers even joining picket lines, it's very clear that Labour still isn't working. Remember, when Labour last left government, they admitted there was no money left, and no Labour government has ever left office with unemployment lower than when they came to power. That is what is at stake. It is our next leader who will relentlessly continue to deliver for the British people, leading the way in standing up for our ideals and our partners on the world stage, uniting the country and this Conservative Party. I know you all want to hear from the two candidates to help you decide who to choose to lead our great party and our country. So with no further ado, let me hand over to your host here in Darlington, Tom Newton Dunn. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I am, oh, well, this is like pantomime already. Thank you very much. Oh, no, they won't. Oh, yes, they will. Uh, briefly introduce myself, folks, uh, and I'm not going to give you a long speech. I promise you've already had two. My name is Tom Newton Dunn. I've been a political journalist uh, for. Uh, most of my working life, uh, 13 of those years, I've been a political editor, so I've covered a few Tory leadership contests uh, down the ages. You do them once every three years, so we'll be back here in 2025. Uh, I'm booking my hotel already. It's you lot, not me. Um, oh, no, it isn't, and we're all girl for girl. Uh, 
I don't need to tell you how important the Red Wall is, seats like Darlington, uh, that last had, because in 1992, one young Michael Fallon defeated by one young Alan Milburn. It doesn't make all of us feel very old uh, thinking about that. It's a fact to say that, obviously, Darlington turned blue in 2019, as did 50, 55 or so others. <laughs> if your party can't keep those Red Wall seats in 2024, where the next general election is, you won't hold on to power. I think that's a cast-iron fact of, of British politics now. You also don't need me to tell you this is not the leafy, prosperous South. There's some prosperous people up here. There are also some people in quite a bit of trouble. Two little statistics I just wanted to share with you. An opinion poll by Moore & Common last weekend found that across the UK, 33% say they're either struggling or not coping at all. In red wall areas across the Midlands and the North, like these, that number is 46%. The other statistic, utility bills alone are absorbing as much as 25% of households' pre-tax income in red wall areas. That you also don't need me to tell you is an awful lot. So I hope tonight at this hustings will do a little bit differently uh, than perhaps other hustings. We'll all ask, me and you, some very direct questions of the candidates, precisely how it is they're going to help those people in real trouble, not in September, not October, but right now. We'll get to all that, and the fun we'll have with questions a bit later on, though. First, let's hear from the first campaign we should see next. Angela Stone. Some friendly faces in the crowd. Good evening, everyone. I am ridiculously excited to be here. Um, so, tonight I'm here to tell you a story. It's my story. And it starts with the fact that I had never voted Conservative before. I voted for myself. Um, in the space of a year, I went from someone who had never before voted Conservative to an elected Conservative County Councillor in a safe Labour ward. As part of the joint administration, we took power from Labour in County Durham for the first time in 102 years. started with COVID. At the beginning of the pandemic, I was a small business owner, absolutely terrified of what was presenting itself in front of me. So I reached out to my local MP, Richard Holden. Yay! Yay! <laughs> and Richard invited me to join Zoom conversations with other small business owners and crucially cabinet ministers. From the back of these conversations, the government bounce back loan was created. Now, because of one single loan, my franchise business, Lingo Top, was safeguarded, as were the 60 businesses of my franchisees and 130 jobs. And all of that was thanks to Rishi Sunak. <laughs> believe it. Rishi had listened. A politician had listened to me. And it was even the Chancellor. It was my very first positive political experience. Because as someone born and bred in the North East, I'm not hiding this accent, am I? As someone born and bred in the North East, we're just absolutely used to being ignored. We were sidelined again and again. And even when we had a Labour Prime Minister down the road in Sedgefield, what happened? Nothing. So, which politician has done more for the North East than anyone else? Rishi Sunak. From little things like coming and visiting my ward and meeting local businesses up in Dells Lane in concert, through to the Im immense amount of work done in Teesside, Rishi even dared to bring a whole government department up from London and bring it right here in Darlington. Right here in Darlington! <laughs> are making me feel so good. Um, in 2019, the North East voted Conservative like never before. And when I was knocking on doors, people were saying that for the first time ever, they felt important and listened to, just like Rishi had made me feel. And he really inspired me to get involved in politics. 
We need to keep up that momentum. We need to keep that red wall smashed. Let's smash it a bit more. Um, we need a safe pair of hands. And I know as our Prime Minister, Rishi will continue to listen and act in the best interests of everyone, not just in the North East, but all over the country. <laughs> Rishi has proven that he has all of the values and attributes needed to lead our great country. He's honest, he has integrity, he stays calm under pressure. My goodness, did you see him in COVID? Um, and he is brave and bold and makes the big decisions such as furlough. And also, as his experience as Chancellor and in his working life in finance before that, I know that he has all of the skills needed to tackle inflation, control borrowing, and keep interest rates down for families up and down the country. <clears throat> Thankfully, my story has a happy ending. My business and my team came through COVID thanks to Rishi's support. And I know he's the best placed person to be our Prime Minister and crucially win the next general election. And do you know why I know that? Because if he can inspire this concert lass to do a complete 180, then taking on Rishi's taking on I nearly said Rishi's method. But taking on Keir Starmer is an absolute piece of cake. Thank you. Patriotism, fairness, a love of family, pragmatism, the quarter, an unshakable belief that we can build a better future. Rishi has been a fantastic friend to me and to Darlington. Who's committing to levelling up, not just in Teesside, but across the country as well, which is extremely important to me. Rishi, as Prime Minister, will know how to capitalise on the benefits of Brexit. Get it that our towns and villages need as much investment as our cities. to celebrate the extraordinary success of our party, of all of you here in the North East. Because look at this. We've got Ben Houchin re-elected. We've got members of Parliament in Bishop Auckland, in Blythe, in Sedgefield, in Stockton, in Darlington, in Redcar. We've got councillors everywhere. And for the first time in a hundred years, we kick Labour off Durham Council. <laughs> tonight if it wasn't actually for one of those people that I just mentioned. He's a good friend, he's been a great supporter. His name is Matthew Vickers. He's the MP for Stockton South. Now, it gives me just this opportunity to say thank you to Matt for all the support he's given me. He was my first agent when I was first elected. Now but you all know him as a fantastic campaigner because he's campaigned to put more Conservative councillors on Stockton Council. He's campaigned to get himself elected in Stockton South. But what you don't know is that his most important campaign 
is to get the Palmo on the menu in Parliament. <laughs> I tell you this, Matt, if, if, this, if this works out for me, we won't just do Palmos in Parliament, we'll be serving them off the cabinet table in Downing Street. How about that? <laughs> Uh, wonderful as that is, the real reason that I'm standing in front of you today is because our country did something extraordinary for my family. It welcomed them here as immigrants 60 years ago and allowed them to build a better life. Now, I was brought up with a simple set of values. The first among those is that family means everything to me because we all know the bonds of family are far greater than anything any government could ever hope to replicate it, and we as Conservatives must never, ever forget that. Now, in my family, we prioritised hard work as the way to forge ahead. And when I was working for my mum in her shop, I was out and about in the community delivering medicines and seeing the power of her small business to provide jobs and opportunity in our local community. Now, for my parents, there was one thing above all that they thought could give their kids a better future, and that was simple. It was education. And that's why I passionately believe that the best way we reduce inequality, the best way that we spread opportunity, indeed, the best way that we transform people's lives is by ensuring that the birthright of every child is a world-class education. It's not just about schools. It's not even, and especially not just about university. It's about fantastic apprenticeships and technical education, including the brand new incredible technical institute we are putting right here in the Northeast. <laughs> so those, those in a nutshell are my values. Patriotism, family, service, hard work, aspiration. And I know they are all of your values too, and that's because they're conservative values. Yes. And that's why I want to be your leader and prime minister, because I want to put those conservative values into action to build a better Britain. And just as our country allowed my family to provide opportunities for me, I want to do the same for everyone, for your children and grandchildren, give them the same opportunities too. But how are we going to do that? Well, we need to do three things. We need to restore trust. We need to rebuild the economy. And we need to reunite our country. Now, restoring trust starts by being honest. And as you can see in this leadership contest, I have not made my life easy with the things I am saying. But I believe that our country does face some real challenges. And I want to be straight with everyone about what they are and what is going to be required to fix them. Now, even though that's not easy, it is honest, and that, for me, is what leadership is all about. But in order to restore trust, we also have to deliver on the things that matter to people. That's why I've set out a radical plan to start reforming the NHS, so we can focus less on how much money we're putting into it, and more on the quality of the healthcare we're getting out of it. It's why, it's why, it's why I put the Treasury in Darlington. Because I wanted to send a loud message to Whitehall that there is more to them the North than Manchester. Yeah. And, I'll tell you this. and I'll tell you this, if this works out, it won't just be called the Treasury Campus in Darlington, it will be the Downing Street Campus in Darlington. Yeah. But it's also why I want to up to this lefty work culture that seems to want to cancel our histories, our values, and our women. <laughs> and, and it's why I set out a bold and radical plan to finally get to grips with illegal migration. Because for too long, all of us have been watching on our TV screens scenes that are simply unacceptable of people coming here illegally. Now, with my plan, under my leadership, we will finally get a grip of that situation, stop the boats, restore trust, and take back control of our borders. <laughs> now, 
when it comes to rebuilding the economy, I don't need to tell all of you what the number one challenge is. You know, and it's inflation. And we must get a grip of it. Because we've seen this story before. We know that inflation is the enemy. It makes everyone poorer. It pushes up mortgage rates. It erodes people's hard-earned savings and pensions. Now, of course, I'm always, as I have done as Chancellor, going to help those who need our help with the cost of living. And this autumn, we can cut VAT on energy bills. And I will go further. But what I won't do is pursue policies that risk making inflation worse and last far longer, especially if those policies simply amount to borrowing tens and tens of billions of pounds, putting them on the country's credit card, and asking our kids and our grandkids to pick up the tab. Because that's not right. It's not right. It's not, it's not responsible. It's not responsible, and it's certainly not conservative. But I am going to cut taxes. In this parliament, for the first time in 16 years, we are going to cut income tax. Because as conservatives, we need to make sure that hard work always pays. And I'm going to go on cutting income tax for years to come. But we're going to do that responsibly. We're going to do it by being tough on public spending and by growing our economy. And this autumn, I'm going to radically reform business taxes to actually cut those taxes for businesses that are doing the right thing. Businesses here in the Northeast that are investing, expanding their manufacturing capacity, innovating to create new products and services, putting in advanced robotics and automation, because that's how you drive growth in a modern economy. But I'm also going to take advantage of our Brexit opportunities. Now, I know there's been some talk in this leadership contest, and I've been amused to discover or read that apparently I'm not, I'm not a proper Brexiteer. Well, I tell you, I was proud to actually vote for Brexit in the first place. But more than that, I was then proud to figure out, well, what are we going to do with this? And as a backbencher, I came up with a new policy, a radical new policy, that's going to attract jobs and investment to the United Kingdom. And then I went one further as Chancellor. I worked with Jacob Young. I worked with Ben Houchen. And we delivered it. And we put the biggest free port in the country right here in Teesside. <laughs> and, and when I did my budget last year, do you know how I concluded my budget? I talked about the future economy that I wanted to build in the United Kingdom. And I talked about Teesside. I talked about what we were doing here. I talked about the jobs we were creating, the investment we were attracting, the innovation that was happening in vaccine manufacturing, in the new renewable industries of the future. And I said I wanted to deliver that same energy and optimism that we are doing here across the United Kingdom. And if you give me the chance, that's exactly what I will do. Because where the North East leads, the rest of the country will follow. Because in just a couple of years' time, we need to reunite our country. We need to do something, friends, that has never, ever been done before. We have to make British political history by winning a fifth election in a row. Now, I know that working together, all of us, we can do it. But it's going to require us to appeal to swing voters everywhere, in the north, in the south, remain areas, Brexit areas. Rural areas, urban areas, labour areas, liberal areas, Wales and Scotland. And I passionately believe, and all the evidence supports, that I am the candidate that gives our party the best opportunity of beating Labour and ensuring Keir Starmer never walks through the door of 10 Downing Street. Let me just say this. You saw me as Chancellor in the pandemic act boldly, quickly, radically to support jobs and businesses and to ensure that our economy remained resilient in face of the bigger shock we suffered in 300 years. Well, I will bring that same sense of urgency and grip to every other challenge that government faces to build the better Britain that I talked about, where our kids can walk safely on the streets at night 
where our schools and apprenticeships are the envy of the world and providing opportunity for our young people, where our NHS is reformed and efficient and there for us when we need, where our economy is like Teesside, creating jobs and prosperity in every part of the country. But beyond that, I promise you this. I will work my socks off, I will give you my everything to ensure that each and every one of you here tonight can always feel enormously proud of the Conservative government that I will be privileged to lead. <laughs> Seven years ago, I stood in front of a group of people in Richmond in North Yorkshire and asked them, to select me as their candidate. And they did me the greatest honour of my life in allowing me to be their Member of Parliament. And many of them are here tonight, and I am so grateful for the love, the kindness and support they have given me that led me to this place. And now, I ask you all the same thing, humbly, for your support, not just to be your next party leader, but also the next Prime Minister of our great country. Thank you very much. Submission. The Conservative Party can only afford one microphone these days. Uh, as you know, you're a bit hard up. So while that's been switched backstage, uh, I'm going to talk to you very quickly. So this uh, entire hustle has been broadcast by Talk TV tonight, currently on the programme I present, the news desk, which is the Alley News programme you'll know and watch avidly, I know. To help us, I'd like to do a very quick show of hands. And don't worry, I've had this signed off by your party. Uh, all of those who still don't know which candidate they'd like to vote for, please raise your hands now. That's really interesting. By my printed count, I'd say that's probably 40 or so percent, looking up in the gods there. Everyone up in the top floor, but they're all journalists, so that probably doesn't count. Wise <laughs> um, people like me, we don't choose. That's really interesting. Thank you. Around 40, 50 percent still undecided. We hope tonight obviously uh, helps. Without further ado, let's move on now to the Liz Trust campaign. Please welcome Anne Marie Trevelyan. to join this extraordinary uh, event that the Conservative Party is doing to choose not only our next leader, but of course the next Prime Minister. I just want to correct something that Angela said. She said there was a happy ending to her story. I don't think there is. I think she's going to be standing as an MP before we know it. It was a joy to hear that fantastic story from her about her political journey and indeed that incredible, incredible result uh, in County Durham, which I think tells the whole world that nothing is impossible for the Conservative Party. We bring our energy, our passion, and we know uh, that voters understand what that means. So I'm really excited that we're here tonight. I think, honestly, as an MP who has sat around the Cabinet table, uh, we have two incredible candidates, both capable and willing to serve the country in what will be an incredibly difficult time, uh, as we've heard uh, from Tom, some of the statistics, let alone the realities that we know are really hard that are coming ahead of us. And we are going to need a Prime Minister uh, who can stand up and strongly lead us. Now, I'm here this evening uh, backing uh, Liz Truss. I think both fantastic candidates. But my voice uh, and my vote is for Liz. Uh, and I'm going to tell you why in as short a time as I can, because I'm getting shouted at by Tom Newton Dunn, an experience that we as politicians get quite a lot from our journalist friends. Uh, there are three reasons. I call it Liz's ABC. She's um, incredibly ambitious for our country. She is bold in the way she takes decisions, and she is confident in her energies to give the country what it needs. Just to expand on that a little bit, I have watched her uh, drive forwards policies, let's take the Northern Ireland Protocol Challenge, incredibly difficult. She has been ambitious and determined in making sure that we hold our union together. The UK's most important job, the UK government must ensure our union is secure. And Liz has taken on that challenge and driven through the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill to make sure that our union will be secure. Incredibly brave and very, very impressive. She's also incredibly bold. Let's be fair, who wants to go 
stern faced Defence Minister Lavrov in Russia and come away in one piece. That is no mean feat, not only uh, because of the challenges of being Foreign Secretary and having to travel in this incredibly difficult uh, war torn time where Russia has invaded a sovereign democratic country, but because she has known and led the charge across the world to say we must be bold and we must stand up for democracy. We must stand alongside those who are willing to fight and watch their sons and daughters die to defend democracy. She has been incredibly bold. She has taken on detractors across the world and led the UK charge to do that. I am incredibly proud of her. I've sat and watched her day in, day out battle that one across the world. And most importantly, she is incredibly confident for our country. As she puts it, she knows our best days are ahead of us and she wants to make that happen by giving back the power in every conservative way, stripping away those regulations, uh, handing back more of our money for us to determine how to spend it. She is absolutely a Tory to her boots, speaking as a Northern Tory, a very proud most Northern Tory in England that I am. I am incredibly proud to say I would be so proud to serve with Liz uh, in uh, a government led by her. I think we have a really exciting time ahead. You have the most important job, and I'm sure all your friends and neighbours say, how come you get to choose the next Prime Minister? Because that's how the Conservative Party constitution works. You have an incredible responsibility, and whichever one of our two candidates selected, we will have a great leader. But for my money, it's Liz's ABC, ambitious, bold and confident. I look forward to hearing your votes on the 5th of September. Thanks, guys. can unleash the potential of all the people who make our country so great. To win the next election, we need to deliver, deliver and deliver for the British people. I know that our country's best days lie ahead. I'm the candidate with a clear vision for the future who can drive change and get things done. As Trade Secretary, I negotiated deals with allies like Australia and Japan, creating opportunities around the world for British business. And as Prime Minister, I will continue to deliver on the opportunities of Brexit. I will lead a government committed to core Conservative principles. Low taxes, a firm grip on spending, driving growth in the economy, and giving people the opportunity to achieve anything they want to achieve, regardless of their background. I will work day and night to lead a party and a government that puts more money in your pocket and secures a better life for you and your family. I've consistently delivered when I have said I would. And I love our country. I want the best for us all. And I'm the person to do it that. Please welcome Liz Truss. Hi everybody, it's fantastic to be here tonight in Darlington. I remember back in 2017 when Ben Houchen and Simon Clark got elected. And I could see that we made a crack in the Red Wall. But 2019 was a massive demolition job. We got Bishop Auckland. We, we, won, we won here in Darlington. We took Darlington back. And we also got to the Labour heartland of Sedgefield. Tony Blair's constituency. And as Blair himself would say, things can only get better. <laughs> and if you select me to be your Prime Minister, I will work to take new seats in the North East. Wandsbeck, I will work to take Sunderland. Yes. And I will work to win big. And I know we can do it. Now, I'm not somebody from a traditional Conservative background. I grew up in Paisley in Scotland and in Leeds and I went to a comprehensive school. And at that school what I saw is I saw too many children let down by low expectations because of their background, because the lefty Leeds City Council preferred political correctness to making sure that children learnt English and maths, and because of a lack of opportunity in the area. And I thought that was a huge waste of talent and opportunity. And what I want for our country is I want everybody to be able to succeed, regardless of their background, regardless of where they're from. I want people to get on in life, and I want us to be an aspiration nation. But I think that we know that we 
we face difficult economic times. We've got the aftermath of the COVID pandemic. We've got the appalling war being perpetrated by Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. And I'm afraid to say that over the last two decades in the UK, we've seen relatively low growth. So now is not the time for business as usual. We need to do things differently. And that's what I would do. I would have a bold plan for growth. First of all, we need to get those EU laws off the statute books by the end of 2023. <laughs> what to do, whether it's our investment rules, and we need to unlock huge swathes of investment into parts of our country like the North East, into the steel industry, into the tech industry, into the new gigafactory in Blythe. That's what we need to do. But we also need to lower taxes. I didn't agree with raising national insurance. We promised not to do it in our manifesto, and we need to help those people who are struggling with the cost of living. I would also have an immediate moratorium on the green energy levy to cut people's freedom. And I can promise you I would do that as Prime Minister from day one. I'd also keep corporation tax low. Because if we raise corporation tax to the same level it is in France and 10 points higher than Ireland, we're not going to attract the growth. We're not going to attract the investment. And I'm afraid to say our country is more likely to go into a recession. We need to get the economy growing. And I believe, as Conservatives, we need to be on the side of small businesses. We need to be on the side of the self-employed. We need to be on the side of people who work hard and do the right thing. And we need to enable people to keep more of their own money. Those are Conservative principles. in a conservative way. Of course we need to get the A1 jeweled. We need to get it jeweled from top to bottom. And we need to sort out the broadband, and we need to sort out the mobile phone signal, and we need to make sure that funding is fair. But we also need to have more investment. And what I would put in place are low tax enterprise zones. I'd deepen our free ports like our Teesside free port, and I'd make sure that we change our planning system. Now, before I became an MP, I was a councillor and I sat on a planning committee. And those are hours in my life I will never get back. <laughs> because, because we were told what to do by the planning inspectorate in Bristol or the mandarins in Whitehall with their housing targets. I don't believe in that. I believe people here are the best place to make decisions about their own future. I'm proud that I'm being supported in this campaign by the former president of the National Farmers Union, May Rig Raymond, who I worked with at DAFRA. And he knows that I'm somebody who wants to see farmers producing food. Not filling in forms, not doing red tape, not filling fields with paraphernalia like solar farms. What we want is crops and we want livestock. And I know the food produced in this part of the country is fantastic. And I want to see more of it. Because we are facing, we are facing a massive issue with food security and energy security because of the war in Ukraine. And I've been tough in standing up to Russia and standing up to Putin. We were the first European country to send weapons to Ukraine and I put on the toughest package of sanctions on Russia of any country in the world. But we cannot be complacent. Our security is more under threat than it was. We have an increasingly assertive China too. And what I would do is raise our defence spending to 3% of GDP by the end of the decade. a defence manufacturer in Huddersfield and its businesses across the north of England, right across our country, that will benefit from increased spending on defence.
But we also need to defend our borders. And we know that appalling people traffickers are creating terrible, illegal immigration across the English Channel. I worked with Priti Patel on the Rwanda scheme. It is the right scheme. But we need to expand it to more countries, and we also need to legislate to make sure the British Bill of Rights cannot be overruled by the ECHR. And we are able... for freedom and democracy, and we've led the free world in backing Ukraine. And in fact, there is a street in Kyiv now named after Boris Johnson. That is fantastic. <laughs> he is so but as well as freedom and democracy overseas, we also need it here in Britain. And I'm a, I'm a straight-talking Yorkshire woman. I know that a woman is a woman. <laughs> I can see people in Darlington understand that, but believe me, there are some people in Whitehall that don't. And what, what I will make sure is that our single sex spaces are protected, that domestic violence shelters are protected, and we are standing up for women's rights. <laughs> and as Foreign Secretary, I travel around the world, and I know that people have huge respect for Britain and what we brought to the world, our values of freedom and democracy and the rule of law. But unfortunately, there are too many people in Britain who don't seem to agree with that, who seem to think we should be ashamed of our own country, who seem to think this country is in decline. We will prove those people wrong. We will prove that our best days are ahead of us and we have huge opportunities that we can unlock. And as Prime Minister, I'm somebody who will deliver. Now, I delivered at the Department of Trade. I delivered dozens of trade deals. Even though people said it couldn't be done, that we couldn't get better deals than the EU, we got better deals and we got more deals than the EU. And I also made sure that our trade negotiators were based in the Department of International Trade here in Darlington. So that the needs of industry in this area can be represented in the deals we're negotiating. At the Foreign Office, I created the new sanctions regime in record time. And I also put through the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill to restore the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And lots of people in Whitehall didn't like that. It wasn't popular. People didn't want to upset the EU. But I got it done. And I got it into Parliament, and I got it through Parliament. Because, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not somebody who is prepared to take no for an answer. I will deliver what people want us to deliver, and I will deliver it within two years so we can win the next election, and so we can beat Keir Starmer, who is yet another North London Labour leader who doesn't understand the people of this country, he doesn't understand aspiration. He doesn't understand why people voted Conservative here in Darlington or across the North East. And we will deliver. We will deliver jobs, we'll deliver growth, and we'll deliver opportunities. And we will help people with the cost of living crisis. And we will help people earn more and succeed. And we will give people more of their own money so they can invest in their own future. And we will most of all be proud to be Conservatives. Because that's why people voted for us, not because they wanted the Labour Party, but they wanted a strong Conservative government that delivers for every part of this country, and particularly here in the northeast of England. Thank you very much. Right, folks, well done for sitting through, what was that, an hour or so of speeches. Funny old thing they ever ran. Who'd have thought politicians can speak? Uh, here's the fun part. Uh, we all get to ask some questions. 
so this is how it's going to work. I go first, uh, and then it's your turn. Now, a uh, couple of things. If you've got a question, have a look out now for people in white hoodies. Um, they are around, they have microphones, and they'll come to you. But make sure you can see them, uh, and they'll come and find you. And the other rule, if your question's already been asked, please don't ask it again. Uh, well, you laugh, but you'd be surprised. Uh, and also, uh, just keep it to one question, and we'd be very grateful. So, without any further ado, please welcome back onto the stage, Rishi Sunak. Rishi, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Every poll out there says Liz Truss is going to beat you by a margin of two to one. Why are you so far behind? Well, the only poll that counts is the one at the end of this thing, and we're only just getting started, Tom, right? <laughs> so, so, you don't want to answer that question. No, no, I'm, I'm out and about all day, every day. I'm giving it absolutely everything I've got, and I'm fighting for the things that I passionately believe in that are right for this country, and I'm just going to keep doing that with everything I've got until the last day of this campaign, and I hope I get to see lots of you over the next few weeks. Let's talk about the main story of the day, or quite frankly, the main story of this whole contest, the cost of living crisis and energy bills. We had some terrifying new figures today. You've seen some projections on where energy bills are going to get to, uh, rising to some £4,400 a year, potentially, uh, next April. There are around 1900 for the Amish family now, that, that's a monumental rise. Now, you've announced today you're going to use the same framework, in your words, that you used in May as Chancellor, direct support, grants, payments, whatever you want to call them, uh, for families. In May, you spent £15.3 billion helping people pay their bills. Are you prepared to, say, to, to spend the same figure again? Well, look, I don't, I don't think that will be necessary, because what we're talking about now, Tom, is the extra increase on top of what we thought. And we already thought bills were going to go up to £3,000 when we announced that support. And it, I, it's, it's really, really serious. And I think everyone should be under absolutely no illusion about how difficult it's going to be for millions of families this winter. And our responsibility as a compassionate Conservative government is to make sure that we support those who most need our help through that. And that's what I did as Chancellor for two years, and that's what I'm going to do as Prime Minister. And I want to go further than I did previously, because the situation is worse. It's right that we target that on the people who most need our help. And today, I announced what I did, because I wanted to give those people peace of mind. And the only way to help them is with direct support. Because tax cuts alone are not much good if you're a pensioner who's not earning any extra money. They're not much good if you're working hard on the national living wage, because Liz's tax cut is worth about a quid a week for that person. It's worth zero for a pensioner. That's not right. That's not a policy that's going to help people get through the winter. And I, I think it's wrong that she's ruled out direct support to families, because we as a Conservative government have an obligation to help those who are most vulnerable. That is the only way to do it. And that's what I would do. Believe me, I have a few questions for Liz as well on this one. But I just want to clarify, in May you spent £400 per household, free money, rich or poor, to help them pay those bills, no matter what their income is. That's the sort of thing you'll do again? No, because I think what we need to do is target our support for the most vulnerable. So, so what I announced... Every, what, every household, no matter how rich or poor, won't necessarily get free money this No, time. because what I want to do, first of all, is cut VAT on energy bills, because that's one of the levers that we have. It's a Brexit opportunity, which we can deliver, and that provides some support to everybody. But where we need to go further is particularly for the most vulnerable households. Look, and we're lucky. There'll be lots of us here in this room tonight for whom, look, it's going to be difficult, but it's manageable, right? Or it means you go without the, the luxuries, the extra things in life. But there are millions of families for whom it is simply not possible, no matter how hard they work, to come up with the, that kind of cash. And that's why our support should be targeted not on massive tax cuts for very wealthy people, but should be targeted on helping the people who most need it. And if we don't do that, I can tell you, not only will millions of people suffer, we will get absolutely hammered when it comes to an election. The British people will not forgive us for not doing that. Let's talk about... <laughs> Let's talk about how you're going to pay for this. I mean, I think we agree we're in the billions here, don't we? Now, you've come up with efficiency savings. Now, that to journalists like me means, quite frankly, you've got no idea how you can pay. Efficiency savings, you can save 5 million, 10 million. You're not going to get to billions by efficiency savings. What you end up having to do is borrow a lot more, which is precisely what you just accused Liz Truss of doing. Well, so, no, you're, you're respectfully totally wrong. 
actually. <laughs> so so what, what did I just do in one of my last things as Chancellor? Because we had to find some extra money to send to Ukraine, right? Because we wanted to keep supporting them with their war effort. And I didn't just find 5 million or 10 million from a roundabout government. I found a billion pounds by efficiencies across government. And we sent that billion pounds to Ukraine to provide, to provide support for them. So when you say well, you can't find efficiency savings, you can only find five or ten, I literally just found a billion, and I did that a couple of months ago. So yes, I can find efficiency savings, and that's how we should pay for this in the first instance. Which I suppose begs the question, why didn't you find more efficiency savings then? But let's not get into a, a, a trap on that. Well, because, well, what we needed to send them was about a billion pounds, and I found a billion pounds. Because, uh, look, it's really important that we continue supporting Ukraine in their efforts against Russia. I think it's something that we're probably all very proud of in this room, right? <laughs> Nevertheless, your critics say vast state handouts spent on propping up a failing economy is not exactly a very Tory thing to do. In fact, they accuse you of being Gordon Brown 2.0. Well, I tell, you, I tell you what is a conservative thing to do. Conservatism is about being pragmatic, right? That has long been a tenet of our party. And we've got to take the world as it is, not how we would like it to be, right? So if we've got a situation where millions of pensioners, for example are going to see increases in their bills of £1,000. Right? They're not in work. Liz's tax cut or any tax cut is not going to help them. So how else do you propose that a Conservative government that wants to support some of those vulnerable pensioners does it? Now, I, I think it's an entirely Conservative thing to give people dignity in retirement. I think it's an entirely Conservative thing to support the most vulnerable pensioners, and that's what I'm going to do. Now, the uh, Director General of the CBI, Tony Danker, a man who you will know, uh, has joined, I have to say, very loud calls across government, across party lines today to ask you, Liz Truss, and Boris Johnson to get together in a room and decide exactly what this sort of targeted help should be for people, not on the 6th of September, right now, because you just simply don't have four weeks to spare. Are you prepared to do that? But of, of, of course I'm happy to do that. But as you can see, we're in the midst of uh, a leadership contest where... The answer to that very question is at stake, right? So because get into a room and sort of that. You are prepared well, to do that? You'd well, like I mean, to do I'm, that? I'm looking at our party chairman. I'm not sure how we feel about curtailing this process. I'm not it's sure not how all the rest the of you would It's simply getting but, in a room and agreeing about it. Hang on. We, we, we are actually having this debate, Tom, because it's an important debate to have. Because you're going to hear one point of view from me about how I think we need to do it this autumn and winter. I believe it is the only way to do this, to actually help the people who need our help. And then in 15 minutes' time, you're going to hear a completely different approach. Right? And the question is, if you only want to help these people with tax cuts, I, I'm, I'm struggling to see how it's possible. Right. So we can get in a room all you want, but at the end of the day, that policy is not going to work. So if you can get Liz to change her mind on that when she talks to you, I'm very happy to get in the room and we can hammer this out. OK, let's, let's see what uh, Liz says and see if we can have some peace by the end of this. I suspect you're probably right um, and we won't. Let's move on, though. Uh, we're in the red wall here, as well, you know, uh, Darlington was a Labour seat for 27 years before 2019. How are you going to repeat your predecessor's feat, Boris Johnson's feat, of winning 55 seats across the red wall? Because, as your critics say, you're no Boris Johnson. Yeah, well, look, I, you know, for better or worse, none of us are Boris Johnson, right? I think we can be clear about that, right? And um, so, look... I, you know, I'm really privileged to have the support of Ben Houchen, right? And if you, if you think back to Ben's first election and his second election and all the change that's happened in our area over the last several years, which I talked about in my speech, right? That has been something that has been the product of an enormous amount of people's hard work and effort. And I am confident that I can continue to do that. And that's why Ben is supporting me, because he knows that I deliver for the people of the Red Wall, and I deliver not just practical things like the Treasury or free ports or investment in high streets and town centres and spreading opportunity, it's because my values are the same values as the people that we all live and work amongst, the people that we represent. It's those values of hard work, of family, of fairness and aspiration. It's not about Blue Wall or Red Wall, those are British values and they're Conservative values, they're my values and that's how we're going to win all these seats. All right, let me... Let me... I want to ask you uh, about you personally now, because it was noted in uh, the Sunday Times this weekend, dare I say a Sunak leaning newspaper, that you and your wife are personally richer than the Queen. <laughs> now, what do you say to people who say to you, how on earth do you have any idea what life is like, a tough life is like for us? Yeah, so, uh, I think you're, you're probably about the tenth person who's asked me this question, Tom, right, on this leadership trail. 
And I, you know, I think in our country, we judge people not by their bank account, we judge them by their character and their actions, right? And <laughs> And yes, I'm, I'm really fortunate to be in the situation I'm in, I'm in now, but I wasn't born like this, right? I wasn't, I, I, my parents worked really hard to provide me with all these opportunities. I'm, I'm not going to apologise for what they did for me. And in fact, that's why I want to do this job, because I want to provide those opportunities for everyone else. That's what Conservative governments do. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to get into a little bit of quick fire just to get some sort of pretty straightforward answers now because right. we're coming to the end of, of my turn soon as uh, the audience's turn. Uh, state spending is pretty popular uh, in uh, parts of, of the north, perhaps more popular than parts of the south. I wanted to ask you, public services are going to be hit really hard by inflation. 13% hits the NHS and schools just as much as it does individuals. So are you prepared to keep NHS spending real terms where it is now? The NHS spending is, is fine where it is, and what we need out of the NHS is more reform, more efficiency. Yeah. That's what I'm going to yeah. deliver. So, <laughs> the, uh, the important question here is you're going to have to spend 13% more on the NHS to keep it the same budget real terms now. I think you just said you're prepared to do that. No, no, no I'm, I'm not prepared to do that. The number is also not right, but in any case, the, oh. no, I did something very difficult as well, This is the quick fire. No, well, well wait, this is a really important question because it's the most important public service, right? And it's the thing that everyone does rely on and it's not working as well as it should right now. Right? Now, I did something difficult, which was getting some more funding into both the NHS and social care, which for too long has been the poor cousin of the NHS. We need to fix that. But we're Conservatives in this room. It's not just about putting the money in. I did do that because it was the right thing to do, whether it was popular or not is a separate thing. But now we've got to move on to reforming and getting the efficiency out of it. Now, I've got a bold plan to do that. I'm sure we'll talk about it in the Q&A, but it means being radical. It means being tough on the things that we were too scared to confront, like missed appointments, which I want to clamp down on. But that's what we're going to do to get better performance out of the NHS. That's what Conservative governments deliver, and that's what we need to do if we're going to get people's taxes down. Okay. So that's what we want to do, right? OK, now the real quick fire starts. This, this should be a bit easier for you. Should the parliamentary inquiry into whether Boris Johnson misled Parliament continue? Yeah, I, I, mean, well, that, as, I mean, absolutely the MPs who are on that panel will make the right decisions for that. You're, and I you're, fully you're an MP. Them. Do you want but to I'm continue? Not, I mean, the, right, the Privileged Committee should make all those right decisions. That's why we have a parliamentary... It's not a government decision. And there's an important right. distinction, right? Because Parliament is its own entity. There are independent MPs who are on there who will make all the right decisions. But look, as a general question, I think trust and integrity and decency in politics is fine. really important. And as Prime Minister, that's what I want to bring back to government. Just on Boris Johnson. <laughs> this is really straightforward. Is Boris Johnson's downfall his own fault or someone else's? His own. OK. There's a quick fire. It's an answer. Powerhouse well. We're going to rattle through these folks so you get lots of time as well. Powerhouse, Northern Powerhouse Rail, which is the, the high-speed link between uh, Liverpool, Manchester and Leeds. The government recently said it's going to not do it. Would you reinstate it and do it? No, that, that's, that's not right. The government actually said it was going to spend £96 billion over the next several years. But not on a high-speed link from east to west. Uh, yes, actually, improved connectivity across right. east to west. Believe me, I know. I travel from North okay. Allenton to Manchester and it is a nightmare, right? And it's far easier to get to London. And we will fix it, right? We're going to fix it and we're going to get that journey time down to a half an hour between Leeds and okay. Manchester. We're going to connect up all the towns and cities of the north. I was proud to do that as Chancellor. And as a Conservative government, for the first time, people are recognising, gosh, these guys are investing in the north. They get it. And as Prime Minister, I'm going to carry on doing exactly that. You won't change the current government plan, will you, though? No. OK. If you lose this contest and you're invited to serve in a Liz Trust cabinet, will you? Yes. In any job? Yes. OK, that's great. That, was, that really was a quick fire. Thank you. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's not, it's, not, it's not the first time these questions have been asked, right? <laughs> it might be the first time this audience has heard them. Uh, finally, and I'm going to ask this of Liz Trust, too, and then it's the audience's turn. Uh, your predecessor's personal failings is one of the main reasons why we're here. Is there anything you've done in your past life that could one day embarrass your government? <laughs> or is every Prime Minister entitled to a past? Oh, gosh, well, I mean, everyone has a past, right? I mean, I think, and look, mine, everyone knows about. I've been in a serious, significant job in the public eye for the last two years. So, and look, the most embarrassing thing that's happened to me is I, 
you know, struggled to pay for the petrol in a car that wasn't my own, right? So I think you all know about that, right? And, and since then, someone's taught me how to use that contactless machine. And I tell you, it's a really, it's an amazing modern marvel, this technology these days. Some debate about whether that car was really yours as well. But well, I said it wasn't mine. Yeah, no, 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 it's even doubly embarrassing, right? Okay, right. audience's turn. Please right, put up your hands if you have a right, question let's, for let's Mr. Sunak. Should we go straight here? Sir, so you the were gentleman the right, yeah, in, in front. When you've got a microphone With coming your way, you? yeah. uh, if we can wait for it, it's coming to you. Uh, whichever you'd like to do, sir. Hi, Rishi. Hi. My name's Alan. Alan. Yep, yeah, Alan. Nice to see you. Right. Um, something bugged me for the last three weeks about something you said, and I want to read it out to you and see if you stand by it, or whether you want to slightly alter it, or we'll see. As soon as you were elected to be one of the two candidates, you came out and said these words. I believe I am the only candidate that is capable of beating Keir Starmer. Do you stand by that? Just give us a proper answer, please. Do you stand by that? This is what you said. You said it a few times. Yes. And that's bugged me. So I want to know. And the other thing was, can you remember, I don't know if it was Shakespeare or Heseltine, said, he who wields the dagger will never inherit the crown. Do you, are you right, okay. So let's, let's do both of them, right? So, that's all right, uh, that's all right, that's all right. You're fully entitled to ask questions, sir. We, we, uh, and Tom asked question, right? So, yeah, you're asking why I resigned. Yes, it was really sad. I was sad I had to resign, actually. I was sad I resigned. But actually, uh, you, you are totally, and I'm respectfully, you are simply wrong to say that I wielded the dagger. Because, because you know what? It wasn't just me who felt that enough was enough. The government was on the wrong side of yet another ethical decision. And, and it, was, it, was, it was 60 other, 60 other members of parliament also thought that enough was enough because we wanted to change things and that's why we're here. And yes, the simple answer to that question is yes. I am the person who can beat Keir Starmer. That's why I'm standing here today. Okay, next question. Let's go to uh, the lady in the red dress holding her hand up just on the end here. Oh, actually, the lady in front. Oh, but why don't you go now? Go oh, on, that was, that was brilliant you. work. Uh, my name's Michelle, and I would like to ask you about the A1. Um, a lot of people ask us about getting a dual carriageway, and I know that Liz had mentioned that. Um, what would be your plans around that, making the road network better, better for the North East? Yes. So, look, I know it's something that's really important. It's something we put in our manifesto, and it's something, as Chancellor, I, in theory, signed off on the funding for. But I know recently there's been some issue, and the Transport Secretary is having another look at those plans. I'm not sure what the issue is, but as Prime Minister, I can certainly commit to you that I will go and figure out quickly what the situation is, because I would like to see the A1 dual. I travel on it a lot. I travel on the A19. Not only do we need to do that, we need to figure out the T's crossing as well. And those are the types of investments that will make a real difference to connectivity in the north. And you have my absolute assurance, as a matter of urgency, I will go and find out why that thing has been slowed down and get it back on track. Hello. Um, I'm a 70-year-old pensioner. And one thing that's upset me is... I was born in 1952. You changed all the pension rates for 19, if you're born 53 and after. I actually receive, I've paid all my stamps and I receive less money every month than someone who was born from 53 onwards. I don't think that's right. All pensioners have got the same cost of living. And if you've paid all your stamps, why should that be different? Right. Well, are you, are you talking about the, the, the WASPI situation, as it's called, or something different? Just, I'm quite... just the fact that you so, got look, less if, money if when they changed well, all if it's, the rules if it's, on the pension. If it's the WASPI situation, all I can say is, look, that's a process which I know has been really difficult for millions of, of women. It's been through various arbitrations and courts. It's any pensioner. 
Okay, in which case I'm happy to go away and take a look at that because I'm not familiar with the specific issue that you're talking about. But if you email me, I'll, I'll happily go and take a look. Let's go to the left side of the room here. Uh, that's no intention on the, the candidate with the T-shirt wearing uh, Ready for Rishi. Uh, please go and have a microphone to, to Lady in the Ready for Rishi T-shirt. Thanks. Uh, my name's Jill. Um, I'm very passionate about climate change. And I'm very proud of the fact that um, the UK is a leader in offshore wind, and it's very important to the North East. Um, I just wanted to ask one question in terms of your um, attitude to climate change in terms of not going back on our current climate pledges and what else will you do um, to encourage innovation um, in climate technology? Yes, well thank you Jill and is that my, my two young girls who are 9 and 11 who are probably were allowed, I don't know if we let said they could stay up late tonight to watch this or not but in any case um, you know, the only thing they ever ask me about my job is this. Right? They say, Daddy, what are you doing for the environment? The rest of it is, is largely irrelevant to them. And you, you mentioned the great word. It's innovation. Right? The way we're going to solve this problem is not by getting people to give up all the things that they love. It's not by saying endlessly their bills have to go up. It's by making sure that we here in the UK create the new technologies of the future that are going to provide cheaper, renewable, reliable energy for us. And the great news is it's happening right here in the North East. Right? It's happening in Teesside, with hydrogen, with carbon capture and storage, and with offshore wind, with GE's investment, right here creating jobs and the new key that's being developed that I helped approve so that we can start exporting things around the world as well. So that's how we're going to solve the problem. I'm completely committed to all those things, but we're going to do it in a way that is pro-innovation because that's how we're going to bring everyone along with us on this journey by demonstrating that we can create jobs and prosperity in places like this and meet our climate objectives and keep my two daughters very happy at night. So thank you very much. So we go to the gentleman with his hand raised wearing a, a white shirt, grey hair glasses. That's the gentleman, just needs a, a, a microphone. Also sitting on the left, but again, no reflection as politics. Yeah, hi, Rishan. Yeah, my, hi. Name, my name is Kevin. I grew up in the centre of Stockton on Tees. I'm yeah. fairly alongside Tony Reid from the Conservatives. I've just got a very and I'm glad you're pragmatic, because I'm a very pragmatic guy, yeah? <laughs> Can somebody please explain to me what levelling up means? <laughs> no, and, and, and I don't want a political answer. I want a practical, man-to-man yeah. -man answer, yeah? yeah. So, because <laughs> I, I, don't, I do not understand it, yes. to be honest. Good, good thing you didn't say person-to-person. -person. Yeah, that wouldn't have gone down well with this crowd. <laughs> right, so, look, it's, for me, it's very simple. The one-sentence answer for me when I'm asked is that I want everyone no matter where they live in the UK, to feel that they have fantastic opportunities and that they have pride in the place they call home. So that's what it's about. It's about opportunity and pride in your home. What does it mean here? Well, we're delivering the opportunities with things like the Freeport, right, which is attracting jobs and investment. That's an example of levelling up. But we're also wanting to make sure people have pride in the places they call home. That's why we're investing in the high streets and town centres, in Eaglescliff, in Yarm, in Stockton, in Thornaby, in Hartlepool, so that people, when they walk around, feel fantastic about the place that they live and feel that it is not neglected. So if we can do that everywhere, if we can make sure people feel that there's opportunity for them and pride in their home, we are going to have levelled up. That's what we're doing here, and that's what we need to do across the United Kingdom. All right, I'm going to break, I'm going to break the golden rule here. No, gentlemen, hold on to that microphone. I want a question for you now. The same gentleman who asked that question. Are you happy with that answer, yes or no? Do you understand levelling up now? No, I don't understand it. I, I, just, I just want to... Because he's a numbers guy, I play with numbers also. I grew up right in the centre of Stockton, yeah? Just on the news the other day, we have the highest knife crime in the country. What? We have the highest deprivation in the country. You then come in, sir, no disrespect, and you spend £600 billion outside of Stockton, and yet our crime is just the town centres where I grew up. I mean, we didn't have a lot of money, like yourselves. We were quite poor. But what we had was clean. It's no longer clean. And, and, and no disrespect again, you're spending 600 billion. I'm an engineer, worked all over the world on all the big plants, know how they work. You're spending 600 billion for plants that will run at 99 to 100% efficient. Won't give work to the people that right. need it. Hang so on, please. That need it in the centre of okay, Stockton. Let, let, right. Let Vision reply. No, because when I talked about pride in the place you call home, it's of course it's about security and safety. Well, I talked about it in my speech. I want our kids, I want my two girls to be able to walk around Stockton when they're a bit older and feel safe when they go to the cinema there. 
right? So that is about pride in your home. Yes, it's about a town centre that looks and feels great, but it's about something that looks clean, something that's safe. That's why putting more police officers are on the street. That's why we're tackling county lines in places like this, because we need to if we're going to stop drug crime and knife crime. It's need why we need to be tough on stopping and searching people. We need to not let, get, not let political correctness get in the way of actually tackling some of these crimes. That's what I'm going to do. OK. Lucy, we're going to go to the more expensive seats now in the dress circle. Uh, why don't we take uh, the lady who's been very patient with her hand up down here on uh, the left. The lady wearing a, it looks like a red dress from here. Microphone coming to you. That's you. That's you. Exactly. Microphone coming to you in three seconds. Okay. One very quick question. Go on. So, it is about crime, and it's about the fact that um, I feel very aggrieved that the word recreational drug exists. I would like that to be something high on the priority for the future, that it is not acceptable, and that families who are actually um, suffering as a result of um, a group of people who find that recreational drug taking is a pleasurable pastime at their expense where young children are being stabbed and there's county lines problems. So that's one of the big issues that I have. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, you're right to raise it. <laughs> but I, I'm with you, right? I approach these questions first and foremost as a parent. And drugs are horrific and they ruin people's lives. There is nothing recreational about them. Right? I have never taken them, and I will be incredibly tough on anyone who does and those who supply them. Right? Because, look, I, I want my girls to grow up in a safe environment. Right? I want to make sure that they are not at risk of those things. They're not at risk of people peddling things to them that are going to ruin their lives. And I talked about it before. There's another crime, actually, that while you mentioned it, I really want to tackle. And it's a crime that does not get talked about enough in our country, and that's because it's awkward. But as a father of two girls, it needs to. And that is the issue of grooming gangs. Because for too long, for too long, we have not addressed that. Now, these crimes are pernicious. They are horrific. And I want to make sure we have dedicated police units looking at them. I want to make sure we actually record the ethnicity of the people doing them that we don't do today. Right? I want to have a new life sentence with no parole for the people that are involved. Because as I said before, no Conservative government that I lead will let political correctness stand in the way of taking down these people because what they do is horrific and we must stop it. That's incredible. The gentleman with his hand up now, in the middle there, waving his arm now. You red t-shirt or not? No. Uh, sorry, on the left hand side in the, in the white shirt. Put up your hand, that's him, that's the that's one. You. Yeah, good evening. Uh, my name's John T. <laughs> um, I'm just uh, wondering why the government or, or, or you haven't considered, if you want to make an Im immediate impact in people's pockets, reducing the double taxation on, on fuel that people pay at the pump, especially in rural communities where people are so reliant on their cars. And obviously the cost of distribution would then be, uh, you know, would be reduced and help to bring inflation down on pricing. Yeah, look, look, so you're right, and particularly, you know, I represent, as you know, my North Yorkshire uh, friends who are all here tonight, I represent one of the most rural parts of the country, so I know how difficult it is with fuel bills where they are, and that's why, as Chancellor, I did cut fuel duty by the biggest amount that it's ever been cut. But you know what? It's not as if any of you are feeling that at the pumps, are you? Right? Because the way that market works, the way oil prices are, that dwarfs what is going on now with what's going on in the taxes. So the better way to provide help to the people we need to, as I was talking about earlier, is getting direct support to those who are most vulnerable. And then that can then help them with all the bills that they face. And that's what we're going to do. Right? So not only are we going to cut VAT on energy bills, because that does go directly and we're in control of that and help those people, but we're also going to get support to those who need it. And look, if, if cutting fuel duty makes sense in the future, of course I'd look at it. I just did it. right? I just did it a few months ago. But the problem is, as you all know, is it working? It's not obvious that it is making an enormous difference, and that's why we've got to focus on the things that work, not the things that just sound good, right? Because ultimately, I want to help people, and I'm going to figure out the best way to do that. And those in rural areas, as you say, always need to make sure that we look after them, because their heating situation is completely different. And that's why all the interventions I did as Chancellor acknowledge the fact that lots of people are off the gas grid. Right? And I wanted to make sure the support still came to them, because I get that at home every week, and I know that. 
and when it comes to in increasing the energy efficiency of people's homes. I want to focus on those in rural areas because their homes are the ones that are least well insulated and the government can help do that and that's going to save people three, four, five hundred pounds a year if we step in and do that. That's a type of policy that won't just help this winter, it will help every winter for years to come and that's what I'm going to try and do as Prime Minister. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Uh, I think it's going to go to the lucky man in the red T-shirt that Mr. Sunak uh, liked so much a minute back. Uh, if you can pass the microphone to the man with his arm up now. Sir. Hello, I'm Jamie. Um, as a small business owner, one thing that cripples a lot of businesses is business rates. What would you do to help support small independent businesses? Yeah, so you're right. And um, particularly, I don't know about your business, but particularly those businesses in the hospitality and the retail sector. Right? Those on our high streets and our town centres, that is the number one tax that they talked to me about when I was Chancellor. That's why in the pandemic, I did an enormous amount to help support that industry, because I know how important it is to our communities, the jobs that it provides. It's why this year, I cut business rates for those businesses by 50% as Chancellor. That's the biggest tax cut on business rates outside of coronavirus we've ever seen in this country, because I know that it's the number one thing that makes a difference. This autumn in the budget, we will do the same, right? And that's what I've said, because the tax cut we've put in place is just for this year, and in the autumn, we will need to set in place the business rates for the next few years, and the top of my mind is always going to be supporting our high streets and town centres, because they are the beating hearts of all our communities, all our market towns, all our villages, everything. They need our support. It's a conservative thing to do to make sure our communities are strong. The best way to help them is through business rates. That's what I do as Chancellor, and that's what I'll do as Prime Minister. And that, that is it. Rishi Suna, thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, uh, a small interlude, folks, while that one microphone gets uh, swapped back over. What have you spent all your money on? I, I don't really understand. You can have my microphone if you, if you want. Um, interesting, the... Uh, <laughs> I won't repeat that. Um, there's a lot of Rishi T-shirts, a lot of Rishi placards, just out of my own interest. Where's all the... the tr oh, there's a trust T-shirt. There's some trust people. They're there. They're everywhere. They're popping up. Good. Uh, in which case, with no further ado, here is Liz Truss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liz, welcome to stage. Let's get straight to the big story of the day. I think it's a big story of the entire contest, uh, cost of living and those energy bills. Now, Rishi Sigang has just told me he's prepared to match the sort of generosity he showed in May uh, with direct support, government money straight to people's bank accounts to help them pay bills to the tune of billions come the autumn. Will you do the same thing? Well, what I want to do is make sure, first of all, we're reducing taxes, because that is needed to drive economic growth. Currently, the country is predicted to go into a recession. That will be a huge problem. We know what recessions are like. People lose their jobs. There are fewer opportunities. Wages are lower. And we need to avoid that. And at the moment, we have the highest taxes in 70 years. So what I would do is immediately reverse the national insurance rise, I'd also have a temporary moratorium on the green energy levy to save people money on fuel bills. I'd do that from day one. But also what I would do is keep corporation tax low because we cannot tax our way to growth. And I believe in conservative economics. I believe in a growing economy. And a growing economy actually brings in more tax revenue in the future. So that's a really fundamental principle for me. Now, we are facing great difficulties with energy. And I understand people are struggling with their bills on fuel and food. But the first thing we should do as Conservatives is help people have more of their own money. What I don't support is taking, people, taking money off people in tax and then giving it back to them in handouts. That, to me, is Gordon Brown economics. And, you know, frankly, we had, we had, we had years of that under Labour... And what we got was a slow growth economy. And we didn't get the opportunities, we didn't get the enterprises, we didn't get the new jobs in places like Darlington, which is one of the reasons people voted Conservative. They voted Conservative because they want to see enterprise, they want to see new opportunities. And that is why it's so important that we don't raise taxes 
that we keep taxes low, and also we abolish these EU rules right. that are holding back investment Let me into our country. Gordon Brown Economics. You're accusing Rishi Sunak of having Gordon Brown Economics. What I'm saying well, is that... Yes is, no. Well, if you, I was actually responding to your question, Tom, which is what I'm here which for which is this Rishi evening. Which is Rishi Sunak's policies. Which you, is, you know. which is you know, do, you just, do you just think about there's a fixed pie, we have to share out the pie, and we have to give out money and handouts. My view is we can grow the pie. <laughs> That there is a having lower taxes actually helps us generate more income into the economy, so there is more money to go round. And what I fundamentally don't agree with is putting up taxes and then also giving out benefits. I think that's the wrong approach. Okay. Now, here's the thing with tax cuts, and, and you know these numbers as well. What you're proposing that the next cut, or well, stopping the rise, uh, again, uh, saves people about £170 a year. Uh, stopping the green levies, £153 a year. That's a total of £323 a year. Now, energy bills, according to today's predictions, okay. are going up to £4,400 a year next April. They're currently at £1,900. That's where the price cap is. So, with your giveaways, without your handouts, as you just They're put it, you're, you're leaving... Just wait this for the question, Liz. Money, but this question. is the problem with the way that every question can is framed. Well, uh, uh, excuse me for framing the question my own way, but can <laughs> I just frame it this way? You're framing it in a left-wing way, uh, Tom. I'm afraid the whole media does this all the time. All right, we're all, we're, we're all left-wing all left <laughs> stooges, and you're trying to count down the clock. Let me put the question to you. You're leaving with your tax cuts people some £2,000 out of pocket. I ask you again, are you prepared to help them with government money, call them grants, call them support, call them handouts at any stage in your premiership for them to pay those energy bills? Well, I think the important word in your sentence was today. That is the prediction today. This leadership election is about who is going to be the Prime Minister in September. And what's important is the Prime Minister at the time and the Chancellor looks at the situation and, of course, my first priority is reducing taxes. I think it's important pe people keep more of their own money and it's important we grow the economy and we avoid recession. My second priority is dealing with the supply issue. And the number one thing we can do to end this energy crisis is to stand up to Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. Because that is what is causing the global price spike. And that is why it's so important we are investing in defence and we're doing all we can to stop Vladimir Putin. And I also want to make sure we're exploiting all of the gas reserves and the capacity we have in the UK. So we should be fracking. This is important, Tom, because there are three... Let me go on to the three, the three things. No, 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 no but, but it is important we increase the supply of energy. And there are more resources to be used in the North Sea. There is more we can do on nuclear, and there's more we can do on fracking. We should do all of those things. But, of course... In any budget, the Chancellor has to look at the situation people are facing across the country. I think that's and a that decision, way of that not decision, ruling out handouts. Well, am I right? I'm not, I'm not going to say right. in yeah, the I'm middle of that. August what is going to be in a budget no, later this year. But what I am saying handouts. philosophically is I always favour mm. people keeping more of their own money first. And what I think is completely wrong is the idea that we take huge swathes of people's money, hard-working people, and then give it back to them, and then, then claim it's a giveaway and it's our money. That is completely wrong. That's completely wrong, Tom. And I don't believe in it. OK. For record, you didn't rule out handouts. I wonder if it was a handout when Rishi Zunet did it in May, that 15 billion. But I think we've done enough on handouts, as you call them. The CBI Address General, Tony Danker, I put this question to Rishi Sunak a minute back. Uh, he wants you, Rishi Sunak, and Boris Johnson to get into a room, agree a policy right now to help people pay those bills. Not on the 6th of September, when you get into office, or on the 21st of September, which is apparently when your emergency budget is going to be, right now. Would you agree, and do you want to get into that room with Rishi and Boris tomorrow? Well, first of all, I am Foreign Secretary, and I am focusing my energy on dealing with the very serious foreign policy issues we face the issues in Taiwan, uh, the issues with Russia and Ukraine. And that is rightly my focus. We have a Chancellor, Nadim Zahawi. We have a Prime Minister who are in those jobs until September. And I think it would be constitutionally deeply undesirable to try and overrule them with a sort of made-up committee 
of the CBI, me and Rishi Zunak. I mean, I just find it, a, a, a find it an extraordinary Not just because he's a supporter of my campaign, and he is, um, is a fantastic chap. Boris Johnson, yeah, he's done a great job as Prime Minister, delivering Brexit, <laughs> delivering, delivering on the COVID vaccine, standing up to Putin. They are capable people, capable of making these decisions. This kangaroo committee you're proposing sounds bizarre. Okay. <laughs> it was... Tony Danker and Gordon Brown proposing it, not me. For the oh, record, Gordon this. Brown, QED. I know, God, I'm sorry. You're going to go on to Gordon Brown again. Let me ask you about uh, something quite serious. Again, something I put to Mr. Sinek. I'm really interested in your views on. State spending is not immune to inflation. Inflation could pass 13% quite soon. That means government budgets are going to need a lot more money spent on them. Are you prepared to keep the NH budget where it is now in real terms? In other words, spend quite a bit more money keeping spending in real terms where it is now. Well, just to be clear, I am committed to the additional spending on the NHS, the £13 billion. I want more of it to go into social care. I want more of it to go directly to councils. Which what, question. Well, it, well, it is answering a question, because that is the NHS budget. And I do think the ed NHS budget will have to continue to go up in real terms, but I'm not going to prejudge the spending review, which I want to be committed alongside the budget. All right, let me ask you something that's been rumoured. Uh, is it true your team are in open access talks already with the Cabinet Office about what your premiership looks like? No, that's not true. OK, thank you for clearing that one up. I want to ask you about your character and judgement a little bit, because what you say to people uh, who look at your record, and they say to you, she was a Remainer, and then she ripped that up. First she advocated Brits to go to, to Ukraine and fight, then she cancelled that. Uh, then she advocated regional pay, and that got canned in about uh, 16 hours. And that, then you're saying you're not going to do handouts, and they actually deny to me that you are going to do handouts. They say to you, your judgment is all over the place, and it stinks. Well, on the subject of Brexit, I did support Remain. I was you know, pretty much on the fence beforehand, but I decided to back Remain. I was loyal to David Cameron. But the minute that vote came through... I put my shoulders to the wheel, and I think I've done more than most people in the government to deliver on the benefits of Brexit. Whether it's the dozens of trade deals, whether it's the Northern Ireland Protocol, whether it's the toughest sanctions regime. And look, Nick, in politics, you have to be prepared to you know, deal with the situation you face. And somebody who refuses to change their mind, in the face of all the evidence, and I'd point to the national insurance rise as a case in point, even though people are struggling, it, that is a problem. And I'm somebody who is decisive. I have very clear principles. I've outlined them. I want people to keep more of their own money. I want us to be a low-tax, high-growth country. But of course, I'm prepared to consider the evidence and make decisions. And when, when there is a problem, I'm somebody who acts quickly and decisively to deal with the problem. And I'm honest about it. What you see with me is what you get. You know, I'm, not, I'm not the slickest, Tom, I'm not claiming to be the slickest, but I am somebody, and people who work with me in government, and I'm backed by a lot of my colleagues in the Cabinet, and I'm backed by a lot of colleagues who've worked with me, because they know I work hard, I deliver, I'm determined, and I don't take no for an answer. All right. <laughs> I'd like to get to uh, some quickfire uh, now, Liz, and uh, I struggle with Rishi because quickfire and turn to be longfire, but let's see if we can do this quickly, because... <laughs> If you don't, you're just depriving the wonderful audience of their turn to ask questions. Should the parliamentary inquiry into whether Boris Johnson misled Parliament continue? Well, that's a matter for Parliament, but I personally don't believe he misled Parliament. Well, you're an MP. <laughs> Therefore, what is the point of the committee? Look, if you had a vote, would you vote to end it? Well, yes, but there isn't a vote, and it's going ahead. All right. <laughs> Are you clear Boris Johnson's downfall was of his own making or someone else's? The media. The media. The media. It sounds like you're being blamed, Tom, and, you know, who, who am I to disagree with this excellent audience? <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, I think you're always going to get a cut now. Just to be clear, the, Boris Johnson's downfall was the media's fault. That's your real view, is it? Yeah. Not, not the audience's view. Not the audience's view, that's your view. I was one, one of Boris's first backers. I was his first cabinet backer. I was a loyal cabinet minister. 
I continue to serve as Foreign Secretary because I believe it's a very important job and I would be wrong to leave my post. But what, what is done? I mean, you know, what is done is done and we are where we are. Right. You avoided uh, getting into the nitty-gritty of that one. Next quick fire. Would you follow through on Nadine Doris's peerage if that's what the outgoing Prime Minister allowed? <laughs> Answering questions about hypotheticals, Tom. Okay, that, I'll put you on the fence on that one then. Still, <laughs> here's an easier one. Will you reinstate Northern Powerhouse Rail, which the government yes. has? Yes. Yes, and, and it will go to Bradford as well. I can tell you. Okay, it's another big spending commitment. You put that one on the Never Never as well. Oh. <laughs> Tom, what I am about is making sure the economy grows by unleashing enterprise and opportunity, keeping taxes low, getting rid of those EU laws that are holding our country back. And right. that's what I will do. Okay. I believe in Britain, unlike some of the media who choose to talk our country down. For the record, that's the third time you've uh, attacked the media, a lot of which supports your campaign. But anyway, uh, we, can, we can talk about that one later, maybe. Here's an easy one for you. Here's an easy one. I'm sorry, I'm not, it's okay. Are you looking forward to a second Donald Trump presidency? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's pretty unwise to comment on elections in other countries, particularly when you're foreign secretary. Would you like to see him run? I would say it's very unwise to comment on elections in other countries. All right. Uh, the I'm one thing. Be drawn on that one. The one thing you've if done. You ask me an easier yes or no question. I'll answer no, it. This is a really easy one. What's the one thing you've done in government that you most regret? Um. It's, hard, it's hard to come up with one to be honest. It's quite well, well, we've got time, haven't we? Well, I I do hugely regret that the government went ahead with the national insurance rise against. Against, uh, against what was in our manifesto, and I spoke right. out against it as a time. If you lose this campaign and Rishi Sunak asks you to serve in a Sunak cabinet, will you? Look, what, what I care about is our country, and I'm prepared to do whatever job to serve our country is required of me. What I don't understand is, because Rishi Sunak said he'd serve in your cabinet as well, you have diametrically opposed views on the economy, how to get us out of the trouble we're in, and how to help people pay bills. How on earth can you two go on the radio, or the television, or indeed talk TV, and defend each other's economic policies? Well, I might have differences with Rishi Sunak, but I prefer him to Sakir Starmer. It would be, it would be absolutely terrible for our country. All right, final question. I'll ask this of Rishi Sunak too. Uh, your predecessor's personal failings is one of the reasons why we're all here. Is there anything you've done in your past life that could one day come back to embarrass the government that you lead? Or is every Prime Minister entitled to a private life? Well, I, I have no skeletons in my closet, Tom. I think everything there is to be known about me is known about me, and we've mentioned a lot of it already in this interview. <laughs> <laughs> we, we could go on for longer, but that's a no. <laughs> That's a no. Well, what was the first question? There are no skeletons in my closet. Right. There is nothing that is not known about me in let's, the public domain. OK, let's open this up to the audience. And who'd like to go? So we'll, we'll start in what on the cheap seats, but are down there first. <laughs> should, we, should we go to the gentleman in the middle there with the black T-shirt and the black jacket uh, with a microphone coming to you now, sir? Hello, Hello Liz. Hello. My name is Taryn, and I was wondering if you were capable of being able to muster a compliment about your opponent Rishi Sunak's campaign. Well, well, he's got a very nice T-shirt, which I see you're wearing. <laughs> OK, uh, let's have a question from uh, further back in the stalls, uh, if we can get the microphone uh, up there. How about the gentleman who appears to have, air, uh, well, you've all got blue wristbands on, that's going to help. White shirt, very high hand, uh, dark hair, lifting from your seat now, that gentleman there. If you can pass the microphone to that gentleman, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Richard. Uh, Liz, like yourself, a born and bred Yorkshire person, man, woman, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you're a man. Uh, very much like yourself, conservative. From a conservative pedigree, that I am a proud conservative voter, came from a working class background, went to a comprehensive school, 
saw an opportunity to join the British Army, served my country oily for 26 years, retired. Thank you. This is not about me, this is about Liz. Uh, and, and subsequently done very well uh, as a veteran. And uh, my question is about benefits. <laughs> Strange question. But not all benefits are means tested, which means that in certain households where you've got children, mm. some, some earners are now in a, in a sort of situation where they're earning above the child benefit yeah. threshold. But the means salary for that household could potentially result with two earners earning potentially 35, 40,000 pounds a year, significantly more than what I earn, but yet that family is still entitled to child benefits. So can we address how benefits mm. are applied to, to working families? Because mm. I work hard and I've worked hard all of my life. Look, I've recently got a pay rise and I actually learn less because yeah. child benefits being took away mm. from me than what mm. I earned before I got my pay rise because I work hard. Mm. And that for me is conservatism, right? We work hard, we roll our sleeves up, we see strike and grasp those opportunities. And for me, that's a real key focus because when everyone got their £400 payment for energy, well, Darlington Town Centre never looks so busy because they're all in town celebrating, drinking beer and eat, you know. <laughs> Whereas people like me who aren't entitled to those type of payments, okay. I'm toughing it out. See, first of all, first of all, thank you for your service to our country. And... One thing I will do is make sure we have a veterans minister in the cabinet, making sure we support, support veterans. Look, I do think our tax system in particular is too complicated. And I will have an overall review of the tax system to look at how it can work better. I think there are problems with business rates. Uh, there are problems with uh, the way it works for the self-employed. But there are particular problems with families and the way that you know, we, we don't have a very pro-family tax system. I want to make it easier for families where people take time out of work, either to look after children or to look after elderly relatives. And you're absolutely right about the way that the child benefit suddenly cuts off. So I will look at that in, in, in the round to make the system more pro-family, but also simpler for people too. OK, let, let's talk to the lady with the uh, silver hair rather than the grey hair with her arm raised and what looks like a, a green... Blo it's blonde, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just can't trust the media, can you? This is the theme tonight. My apologies. Lady silver with surfer. Um, I am an NHS nurse. I've worked in the NHS for 30 years. I retired in um, 2021, came back to work as a COVID vaccinator mm. out of retirement. I'm also a WASPy woman, so I'm still not getting the state benefit. Mm -hmm. But my question about the NHS is, um, if you could give me a flavour of how you see it needs reforming, and I don't mean just charging £10 for missed appointments, I mean how will you change the group think of NHS management. So, thanks. thanks very much. And um, look, my mum was a nurse working in the National Health Service, in fact, in Leeds at St James's Hospital. So I heard a lot of stories about how things were or, or, or weren't working when I was at home. And you know, what I would say is we need to make sure that we are retaining the really important staff on the front line, our nurses and doctors. And I hear too many stories about how there are lots of layers of management in the organisation, there are a lot of central diktats, that people aren't able to make decisions about what's best for patients. And I think we need more, more local decision making. Uh, I, I think we need to you know, people like you who did a fantastic job coming back into the National Health Service during COVID, I wonder what more we could encourage people to come back to help now that we face you know, issues with waiting lists, uh, issues with people not being able to get GP appointments. But fundamentally for me, the issue does seem to be about excessive bureaucracy, excessive central direction, 
and too many layers of management rather than allowing people on the front line to make the decisions. But, point about the job of Prime Minister is the Prime Minister cannot run every single department in the Cabinet and what I am somebody who does is I trust other people to run things and I would make sure if selected as Prime Minister I appoint a really good Health Secretary who can get on with the job, who can be trusted to deliver and will deliver those changes we need to see on the front line because as you say you know there are real issues and I also want to look at the issue of GPs' pensions because we know many GPs are leaving the profession because of the perverse issues around their pensions. So you give your job to Rishi Sunak, it's been rumoured. Look, I haven't, you know, I'm not getting ahead of myself. I'm not thinking about that at the moment, but I, I can assure you that it's an absolute priority. And you right. know, going around the country and hearing from people, there are, there are real issues there on the front line. Can we get the microphone to the gentleman in the blue jacket uh, in the middle, please? He's been extremely patient, Hannah, Hannah, for a long time. Hi there. Um, my question to you, Liz, is 0.7% of GDP go to foreign aid. What will you do to get it back up to that? Because that was achieved under your tenure as International Development Secretary. And, you know, we're talking now about heating homes, fuel costs and what have you. Go to Africa. They've got no homes to heat. Well, I mean, they don't need heating, but you get the gist. Um, <laughs> Um, they've got no cars to fill. <laughs> they've got no cars to fill with fuel. In fact, they barely have dirt roads, and the only water source they've got is cholera-infested ponds, 15 miles away from their home. So, what will you do to get us back up to that target? Because it's very important to people living in poverty across the world. Well, thank you. I mean, what, what I've done at the Foreign Office, which has now got the International Development Budget as part of it, is I've made sure that we're sending less money to multilateral organisations like the World Bank and instead we're spending more money on humanitarian aid, particularly helping people with the very severe issues in the Horn of Africa, helping people in Ukraine uh, after the appalling war um, has left so many people without homes, without food. So what, what I have done is made sure that we're using the existing budget to really focus on the priority humanitarian issues rather than funding these big multilateral organisations. OK, microphone down here, please. So another a patient lady waiting a long time uh, with a hand up in the black top. That lady just said with the sunglasses on her head. You previously stated that you believe that a woman is a woman. Is there no circumstances in which you would regard a man as a woman or vice versa? You know, I believe everybody should be treated with respect in our society, including transgender people. But what, what I do believe is that biological sex is important. And it is important for making sure that you know, we protect domestic violence shelters, that we protect single sex spaces. You know, women's rights have been hard fought for for generations. And what I am concerned about is, for example, in sport, you know, unequal treatment in sport. So I am very clear that biological sex is important and that's what should guide those very sensitive areas of policy. Thank you. <laughs> of course, just on that one, a, a, man, a man can be a woman legally at the moment if certified by two doctors. Would you want to change that? Well, you can be a different gender and that is fine. You can live in the other gender, if you, if you say wish, and I completely respect that, that is not the same as biological sex. And where there are sensitive issues, like domestic violence shelters, I, you, know, you are perfectly entitled, under the Equality Act, to separate people on the basis of biological sex. Okay, let's... <laughs> Can we go to the lady uh, in the pink top, uh, with a hand up? Uh, I'm not going to... Talk about your hair colour, because I've got trouble for that, but you've got the microphone. Thank you. Um, you've outlined some very innovative policies. How are you going to get any of them through when your government can't even get the civil service back into the office, and the civil service at the top is people in Tyler Bar Remainers? Well, well what, 
what I can say is it, it takes leadership. It takes leadership from the Prime Minister and from Secretaries of State in their department to make sure things get done. And in every single job I've had in government, you know, the Trade Department, the, the, the Foreign Office, I have made sure the things got done. I mean, civil servants, you know, there are some civil servants who, uh, who, who do spend a lot of time working from home, for example, that is certainly true. But what, what I will say about the Foreign Office is people work round the clock. You know, people were in every weekend after Russia invaded Ukraine, helping British citizens get out of Ukraine, helping uh, get the new sanctions regime in place and working extremely hard. So we have some really talented and dedicated civil servants. What's important is that we have the leadership that's clear about what we expect. And if people don't deliver, then they do need to be moved on. And that is something that I've been prepared to do as a Secretary of State, and I would absolutely be prepared to do as Prime Minister. Right. Let's, uh, let's go upstairs. We've only got a few minutes left, but we'll try and squeeze as many as possible. Uh, how about the gentleman with his hand up here in a short sleeve shirt, and he's holding a Ready for Rishu poster? Um, I think he can be turned, though, don't you? Let's see. <laughs> I'm staying in this camp, thank you. Uh, my question to you, Liz, is um, with your trade deals that you've done with um, Australia and New Zealand, speaking as a farmer, a lot of farmers are worried for the future simply because with the tariff that will be, tariffs that will be lowered, which means we'll get more and more uh, meat coming into this country, will that meat be coming into the, uh, into the sectors like restaurants and uh, tra trains and aeroplanes where the public won't see it and will it be to the same standards as our red tractor? Well, look, I, I think that the beef and lamb we produce in Britain is absolutely world beating and I'm proud of the fact that it used to be banned in the United States market but I got access for our beef and lamb into the United States it's now being enjoyed there and we're now selling more and more of it around the world. I think our quality is a premium product. It's absolutely unbeatable. In terms of the trade deals I struck with Australia and New Zealand, I'm proud of those deals. The fact is, before we joined the European Union, we used to buy a lot of produce from Australia and New Zealand. They were some of our closest allies and our closest partners. We closed the door to them when we joined the European Union. And all we're giving them now is the same access to our market that the EU have, but in 15 years' time. And there are protections and there are safeguards for our farmers. But I'm proud of the deal that we've struck with our very close allies. I think it's right that we righted the wrongs of what we did back in the 1970s. OK. Very last question, I'm afraid that is almost time up. So the gentleman sitting in the very front row, waving his hand, wearing the jacket. He's got a rich watch on. He's not carrying a placard. I know that doesn't narrow him down. Put he's... somebody with Liz Truss on their T-shirt, please. <laughs> I don't want to make it easy for you. <laughs> so I'm Sir, good, good evening. Uh, Liz, you spoke about increasing defence spending to 3% of GDP. Could I therefore ask, will your government reverse its decision uh, to cut 10,000 personnel from our armed forces by 2025 at a time when NATO has a major conflict on its border in Ukraine? I do think we need to rethink our security at this very, very difficult moment. And what I have said is I will review the integrated review and look at the increased threat from Russia and also the increased threat from an assertive China. And that is why I'm talking about increasing our defence spending to 3% of GDP. Of course, there will have to be further work to see exactly how that will be spent but what is clear from what is happening in Ukraine is that land wars in Europe are not something of the past, deeply regrettably. They are something that we are facing now. So we do need to look at that again. I will work very closely with the Defence Secretary on that. Okay. Great. I'm sorry, there's some more hands up, but I'm afraid that really is time it. One tiny, tiny thing I want to do before you all go, uh, and you'll remember I asked you to raise your hand when you came in here if you were undecided, 
Please now raise your hand if you are still undecided between Liz and Rishi. Well, that's fascinating. So that looks like, I'd say, 10 to 15% are now undecided, down from 40% when uh, you vote. So someone has changed your minds. Don't tell me who, because I'll get into trouble. Just <laughs> cast your votes. Uh, folks, that is it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Liz Price. The U.S., when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK-16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering. We pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear. We were singing, when you were singing, the masters of the field were coming. We who are boys are coming. The masters of the field are coming. We who are boys are coming. To win the race, to win the race, we trust in God, we trust in God. To win the race, we trust and in that's for, God. And and that's for God. Opoku, right? Masters mm -hmm. are coming. Masters are coming. Mm -hmm. Masters are coming to win the race. Oh, 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 oh. Masters are coming. And then they will sing. Prepare the world. Prepare the world. Then we go more. Then we'll keep quiet. Mm -hmm. Then we will sing. Ah, when they tire, they will come in. Mm -hmm. Diplo, Owens. Diplo, Owens. Are we the game? We have to win the race and take a cup. We are the masters of the field, the best athletes, famous to all, and decent boys. How would you prove? Then they will start. I've been quiet. I have a eye. 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 Hello, welcome to your four coffee quarantine. Nane.
eh ilevi 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 kasana ya kasagana ubiarika ilevi nti say say me ti bing me ni ilevi because ilevi problem no e eh, yes simple na Ghana government is on peso otiase nti na ye be kire mu akire no na watiase ye abusi eh, afo 2020 IMF ma Ghana 1 billion dollars billion with the b same year no world bank ma Ghana 430 million dollars ni na for covid e wi e in 2021 no IMF for some ma Ghana 1 billion dollars bill 1 billion with a b Na World Bank Sama Ghana 130 million dollars. In 20, uh, 2021, no, so 1 billion 130 million yeah. If he World Bank buy any IMF buy no. Now we say post COVID rejuvenation program say what be ma young economy no so into no World Bank ni IMF this is Ghana ma Ghana. Ghana government call Bank of Ghana koyi. 20 billion cities say COVID in T. Now, we have four. World Bank come with 2 billion. Uh, IMF come with 2 billion. World Bank come with 560 million dollars for COVID. I know on some. Most of call Bank of Ghana could use 20 billion cities say COVID in T. Say, I see can we move on content trading here. And I want to move here. Baby, I will be for Ghana. E levy tax, who call ports are e levy, who call airports, who call hotels, but what they are to be beer as or Ghana. E levy, e levy, e levy. Says he can hen alpha petrol, e levy. Who call union or port, e levy. Says he can hen alpha now. In this a ne government a person or tray and say Ghana for a be a yard and a year jumentina or de sa e levy nereba. Yes, you perceive a tray government to say. And you say, I do not need you more. You will never so no near Jai Amano. If you say, Who per se, wound ya, ye live young, ye are responsible citizens, ye and per se, ye 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 stand by, yet Jina Hoka car, ye train fire, or no one can say, Yes, ye are responsible citizens, right? Into ye are responsible citizens. Nana Tinna say, So who per se would free Sika? Not would ye be beer. Because young credit rating record former, and yet young abra bought now the e levy barber to so. I didn't because there is over three, almost three billion Ghana cities a record to the presidency. Three billion Ghana. In it also by seventy five percent. What also by seventy five percent? I will say by three hundred and seventy five million dollars. Three hundred and seventy-five million save and not at the presidency. You don't need three billion Ghana cities going to the presidency. Then now what are you, Mr. Kufuado? Any near Koso war presidency? Then now Modi Sikani a presidency war. Modi a then Modi show suruku and now then now Modi a legislator. Let Ghana legislators. You have two hundred and seventy-five legislators. Then now our legislators no what year Magana. Say, say, minimum can say, hey, Ghana fui. You bet me, Afa, I install it, Watson. IBM computer, our friend is Watson, no? Ah, a hey, artificial intelligence. Ah, hey, hey, nine, over 90% of young parliamentarians, no? You bet me, I replace one with Watson. Watson computer, Ben Wedjuma. Now, you downscale. I then hear 275 parliamentarians out. Then, why am I Ghana? One liability to Ghanaians in a year over 100,000 cities every month per parliamentarian. 100,000 cities. And what was the judiciary? Judiciary, hey. America, yeah, 330 million people. 11 times the size of Ghana. Ghana, yeah, 30.8 million. America were nine Supreme Court judges. A Kufuado Banan saying, Ghana near what 10 Supreme Court judges. A Kufuado are pointing eight. I can't hold into say, say Ghana 30, a, a country of less than 31 million people. No, yeah, what 18 Supreme Court judges. Then, now how young 18? Then, now I think young now just a 
Kronga will be asking now, Ghana and the Wunti, you hear Supreme Court judges, Dignity near World Supreme Court judges. A country of less than 31 million, 18 Supreme Court judges. Ka, ka, one Supreme Court judge, Biano, liability, April $150,000, dollars 150,000 cities a month. Konako Bunkun Tahe, ne V8, ordered them, ne bodyguards, ne, ne driver, ne, 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 then in T Niafa an extra eight Supreme Court judges. And no quan cheng say see a minimum can say ye wa thirty four uh uh friend uh uh ambassadorial post around the world. Thirty four Vatican City ah a wo room cry ye wa ambassador waho then na ambassador wa Vatican City ye magana munkan chile yen ye a den ye wa ambassadors wa baby to say more tanum ne eh, wa friend den Sri Lanka se eh, su Sudan no me ade den o come na ye ne ade buy ntin ne ye wo ambassadors wo Sudan it doesn't make any kind of sense say we we e levy what is this yes some wo eh, 58 eh, eh, diplomatic missions around the world diplomatic mission no anka hun fa so ne say wo wo trade desk ka eddy income commerce e bre Ghana so diplomatic missions around the world they are 50 80 Sika beng wa de bre gana. Moun kan chile ye niye re. E ye kron waste of money and resource. Mou se mou hifre yi levi. Ye bet chila mou se yi levi. No moun kona moun ko yi infi mou amu futu mou. Position sina mou kreti ya hun ninfa sonon. E hon na moun ko yi infi. A deng na mou hao gana fo sa a MPP fo. Deng na gana fo a ye moun ti. Na de biya yen chi ya se yen chi ya se no. Sa position si na yi wese. We were over 2,000 executive positions. We were executive benefits and perks. We were to come to business class. We were four by four. No many others. How many nurses were you for? And I was also. And no, no, but my eleven no income from eleven. You be here for a mroso, mroso, mroso. Then necessary you catch there. I could find the new government. So sad, no. We were going to be for no. No more book. Ghana foka unnecessarily. No more be we are in a we. Na excavator sa unyangu kwa ndo miye nse ye nsa unko ka ni ye nang na niye mfa nye sika niye mfa ntu ye yi levi kason mwa be kache nse mwa kwa shiwe excavator is 85 excavator sa bako ye over 150,000 to 200,000 mwa sa kwa shiwe na kahon na pa no no wehi ye zi kop no wehi ti ni wehi ya anom kop no so awa abona kahon hey ekufu ado and his government why? gana fo Yam Penende and Penetina, E. Levino, one hour, yes, a bash and one hour, while quite free scan was up. Yam Pen in a lay, what when eh, Yanamo Babacu, ye be genuinely the name, and say Yerem Penet, a Kufuado and his government. A ding, a ding, what's it? When a cluelessness meets unpreparedness, no MPP, in Funi, now be whom, Yabram, we're not going to take this, we're not having this, Munfa. Yam Penina in Penetina Elevenu Yetia Munko in Kokat Legislature Munko Kat Executive Munko Kat Judiciary Nasi can ambassadors any they were friending ambassadorial post any ye diplomatic missions Sanya many now moon cancel no more reduce no more for computers in your head legislature say you want 275 no you bet me the drone drone i replace you one you're here 275 at the maximum four per region you're here 64 parliamentarians you're here 211 parliamentarians no where your liability to ghana at about 100,000 cities every month come on enough of this nonsense you're real you're real about your word in class symbol. Okay. Okay. So when we are in class symbol of knowledge, strength, adaptability, uh -huh. energy, freedom, unity, hope, peacemaking, harmony, intelligence, Continue. power of love, strength. Said in class symbols when you are obia bra bobia ebia or boy, yeah. Na ne sign and no pepper no. Na ye the aka and in class symbols in a home. Okay. Now Ghana for Tina Sia who no said said the anad kwaku for the ebu ne mine, ye need your home. And see, this is the Edinkra symbol for failure. What? It's a free medical. So Edinkra symbol, you know, 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 you know
The president is now a free and I this photo it is a castle. Oh, man, you're here, my. Hey! Then, I'm a memoir and quiet, you know. Mother. I come to you.